If you love reading or just prefer to listen, welcome to John Smeaton's Regular Reads. Chapter 9 There was no need for screaming. The freak was quite shocking, but he was chained up inside the cage. I think the people who screamed did it for fun, the way people scream on a roller coaster, not because they were actually afraid. It was the wolf man. He was very ugly, hair all over his body. He only wore a piece of cloth around them, around his middle, like Tarzan, so we could see his hairy legs and belly and, and back and arms. He had a long bushy beard which covered most of his face. His eyes were yellow and his teeth were red. He shook the bars of the cage and roared. It was pretty frightening. Lots more people screamed when he roared. I nearly screamed myself, except I didn't want to look like a baby. The wolfman went on shaking the bars and jumping and jumping around before calming down. When he was sitting on the on his backside, the way dogs do, his top Mr Tall walked on and spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, and even though his voice was low and croaky, everybody could hear what he was saying. Welcome to the Cirque de Freak, home of the world's most remarkable human beings. We are an ancient circus, he went on. We have toured for 500 years, bringing, bringing the grotesque to generation after generation. Our lineup has changed many times, but never our aim, which is to astound and terrify you. We present acts both frightening and bizarre, acts you can find nowhere else in the world. Those who are easily scared should leave now, he warned. I'm sure there are people who came tonight thinking this was a joke. Maybe they thought our freaks would be people in masks or harmless misfits. This is not so. Every act you see tonight is real. Each performer is unique and none are harmless. That was the end of his speech and he walked off stage. Two pretty women in shiny suits came on next and unlocked the door of the wolfman's cage. A few people looked scared, but nobody left. The wolfman was yapping and howling when he first came out of the cage until one of the ladies hypnotised him and her, with her fingers. The other lady spoke to the crowd. You must be very quiet, she said in a foreign accent. The wolfman will not be able to hurt you as long as we control him, but a loud sound could wake him up and then he would be deadly. When they were ready, they stepped down from the stage and walked the hypnotised wolfman through the theatre. His hair was a dirty grey colour, and he walked with a stoop, fingers hanging down around his knees. The ladies stayed by his side and warned people to be quiet. They let you stroke me if you, if you wanted, but you had to do it gently. Steve rubbed him when he went by. I was afraid he might wake up and bite me, so I didn't. What did it feel like? I asked, as quietly as I could. It was spiky, Steve replied, like a hedgehog. He lifted his fingers and his nose and sniffed. It smelled strange too, like burning rubber. The wolf man and the ladies were about halfway down the rows of seats when there was a big bang. I don't know what made the noise, but suddenly the wolf man began roaring and he showed the ladies, shooed the way, shoved the ladies away from him. People screamed, and those nearest him leapt from their seats and ran. One woman, or woman wasn't quite quick enough, and the wolfman leapt on her and dragged her to the ground. She was screaming, fit to burst, but nobody tried to help her. He rolled her over onto her back and bared his teeth. She, 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 start again. she stuck a hand up to push him away, but he got his teeth on, on it and bit it off. A couple of people fainted when they saw that, and loads more began yelling and running. Then out of nowhere, Mr Tall appeared behind the wolfman and wrapped his arms around him. The wolfman struggled for a few seconds, but Mr Tall whispered something in his ear and relaxed. And he relaxed. While Mr Tall led him back to the cage, the, woman in the women in the suits calmed down the crowd and told them to turn to their seats. While the crowd hesitated, the woman with the bitten off hand went on screaming. Blood was jumping out of the end of her wrist, covering the ground and other people. Steve and me were, sta were staring at her, our mouths wide open, wondering if she was going to die. Mr. Tall returned from the stage, picked up the, se the severed hand and gave, it and gave a loud whistle. Two people in blue robes with hoods over their heads ran forward. They were short, not much bigger than me or Steve, but with thick 
arms and legs and lots of muscles. Mr. Tall sat the woman up and whispered something in her ear. She stopped screaming and sat still. Mr. Tall took hold of the wrist, then reached into his pocket and took out a small brown leather pouch. He opened it with his free hand and sprinkled a sparkly pink powder onto the bleeding wrist. Then he stuck the hand against it and nodded to the two people in the blue suits. They produced a pair of needles and loads of orange string. And then, on the, in the amazement of everybody in, in the theatre, they started to stitch the hand back onto the wrist. The people with blue robe, robes stitched for five or six minutes. The woman didn't feel any pain, even though the, their needles were going in and out of her flesh all the way around the wrist. When finished, they put their needles an unused thread away and returned to wherever they'd come from. Their hoods never slipped on their faces, so I couldn't tell if they were men or women. When they'd gone, Mr. Tall let go of the woman's hand and stepped back. Move your fingers, he said. The woman stared at him blankly. Move your fingers, he said, and this time she gave him a wig the gate she gave him wiggle. They moved. Everybody gasped. The woman stared at the fingers as though she didn't believe they were real. She gave them another wiggle. Then she stood and lifted the hand above her head. She shook it as hard as she could, and it was good as new. You could see the stitches, but there, were no, there was no blood and the fingers seemed to be working fine. You'll be okay, Mr. Tall told her. The stitches will fall out after a couple of days. We'll be fine after that. Maybe that's not good enough, someone shouted, and a big red-faced man stepped forward. I'm her husband, he said, and I say we should go to a doctor and then the police. You can't let a wild animal like that out onto a crowd. What if he'd bitten her head off? Her head, her head off? Then she would be dead, Mr. Tall said calmly. Listen, Buster, the husband began, but Mr. Tall interrupted. Tell me, sir, said Mr. Tall said, where were you when the wolf man was attacking? Me, the man asked. Yes, Mr. Tall said, you are the husband. You were sitting beside her when the beast escaped. Why did you not leap to her rescue? Well, I, there was no time. I couldn't, I wasn't. No matter what he said, the husband couldn't win, because there was only one true answer. He'd been running away, looking after himself. Listen to me, Mr. Tall said. I gave fair warning. I said this show could be dangerous. This is not a nice, safe circus where nothing goes wrong. Mistakes can and do happen, and sometimes people end up a lot worse off than your wife. That's why this show is banned. That's why we must play in old theatres in the middle of the night. Most of the time things go smoothly, nobody gets hurt, but we cannot guarantee your safety. Mr. Tall turned around in a circle and seemed to look everybody in the eye while turning. We cannot guarantee anybody's safety, he roared. Another, another accident like this is unlikely, but it could happen. Once again, I say, if you are afraid, leave. Leave now before it's too late. A few people did leave, but, but most stayed to see the rest of the show even the woman who nearly lost her hand. Do you want to go? I asked Steve, half hoping he'd say yes. I was excited but scared as well. You're crazy, he said. This is great. You don't want to go, do you? No way, I lied and slapped on a shaky little smile. If only I hadn't been so scared, scared of looking like a coward. I could have left and everything would have been fine, but no, I had to act like a big man and sit it out to the end. If you only knew how many times I'd wished since, then that I'd fled with all the speed in my body and never looked back. Thanks for tuning in. You've been a part of John Smeaton's regular 